Hey guys, I took a few statistics classes which definitely helped with what I would like to discuss today, but when thinking about topics for the Skipped in School series, I realized that until I took it upon myself, I did not really know how to be an effective researcher. I never learned in school how to identify a good study, and when I found one, how to read it and the raw data so that I could see the broader trends, and if possible, establish causation between variables. It's going to be a very long video, but that's what I want to do today. Talk about what constitutes a good study or source, and when you're reviewing a large data set, how, if it's possible, to identify causation. In school, they always taught us that only government sources or something similar were credible, which is no longer relevant. This reminds me of a post by My Name is Josephine from a year or two back that you might remember, and it really demonstrates the mentality of universities and their perspective on source material. Josephine's twin sister wanted to write a paper about the wage gap for a sociology class at Ryerson University and began corresponding with her professor, Kelly Train, about it. First off, your premise is wrong. The wage gap is very real. So the reason why you are having this problem is because you will not find any sources that state this. That sentence is a disaster. The way the wage gap works largely today is through the glass ceiling. Perhaps you want to write your paper on the glass ceiling. You need to look at feminist sources on the issue. Then she gives a ridiculous list of sources. Do not use business sources. They blame women. The reality is patriarchy. You need to do a lot of research. Look at feminist sources on this issue, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of feminist research on this topic. This is all pretty expected in modern universities, but my real interest in this is in the next correspondence that they had where Kelly Train, the sociology professor, actually outlines what is and is not considered a legitimate source. In the assignment parameter, students are banned from citing government websites and statistical data because they are not scholarly and not analytical and, quote, usually reproduce mainstream stereotypes, assumptions, and misconceptions. Of course, this is totally outrageous, and I would like to believe that none of this acceptance of pseudoscience as fact has oozed into more mathematical fields, but we all know that it has. I got a full Marxist indoctrination at Mizzou, and I majored in economics and finance. I wouldn't be surprised if STEM is next. I bring this up because it's important to internalize that none of us can trust professors or teachers to decide for us the legitimacy of any given source. In fact, we can't really appeal to any authority for this since so many entities, including the government and the media, are trying to influence our perception and make us reject our own reality. All of these entities seem to have biases that cloud their judgment. Many have a Marxist agenda. But the longer I do this, the more I see that the nature of the source is largely irrelevant if the underlying data and data collection methods are sound. Especially when researching topics that are often misrepresented, you may find that the only sources that you have are those that people will view as inherently biased. But if they have the best data or the only people researching a certain issue, you just have to work with it and dig through the data and methodology to see if the study is credible, irrespective of the author's biases. Throughout the rest of this video, I'll be referencing a Robert Putnam study that I broke down in a recent video. Both the study and my recent video are linked below. This is a Harvard study on multiculturalism conducted by a deeply biased leftist, Robert Putnam, who admitted to a Financial Times reporter that he was unhappy with the resulting data and basically that he wanted to sit on it until he could explain away some of his surprising findings that multiculturalism invariably causes high levels of social distrust. Now, if I had eliminated this study because of the author's bias, I would have missed the single most comprehensive study ever composed on the mental and emotional effects of multiculturalism. Robert Putnam was absolutely fastidious in his methodology. His collection method was flawless, the scope of the research enormous, and despite his explanations for the results, if you look at the raw data alone and not his accompanying reason, you can glean incredible insight into the damage caused by multiculturalism. For this reason, I'm far less concerned with bias than your average researcher. That being said, it's always good to know what the bias of the author is anyway. It will help you recognize if they have skewed the data. In the case of Putnam, knowing his bias is helpful because it strengthens the data. It was not what he wanted to find and he refused to release it until pressed. I found this little list of questions that's helpful to apply when you're reading data from a biased author. As you read or listen to biased materials, keep the following questions in mind. What facts has the author omitted? What additional information is necessary? These are important questions to ask because the remainder of what we'll talk about today is focused on breaking apart the presented data. You have to think about the aspects of a study or data collection method that may be omitted. Once you've done your due diligence in terms of identifying author motivation and bias, you can move on and look at the study characteristics and methodology to see if it's worthwhile. I found this blog that tidily summarizes what is generally accepted to constitute a good scientific study. 
Was the study large enough to pass statistical muster? I'll skip most of the first paragraph, but generally, the larger the study, the better. The statistics turn out that if you have less than around 1,024 people for a nationwide study, the margin of error exponentially increases beyond 3%. In a study that reports a 49-51 split, this could render the claim worthless. For the most part, I agree with that. I generally try not to use any study with a sample size fewer than around 1,000. So Putnam's study, which is nationwide with a sample of around 30,000 using census data, had drastically narrowed that 3% margin of error. The other side of this question is to determine if the findings of a study are statistically significant, meaning that there is only an acceptably small chance that the findings were due to random chance alone. The value that is typically used in scientific research is P equals 0.05. This p-value means that the probability that the findings of the study are due to chance alone is only 1 in 20 or 5%. When evaluating a study, pay close attention to this value. As a general rule, any correlation that has a p-value of greater than 0.05 should not be taken as evidence for anything. Back to the Putnam study, he identified strong trends that were statistically significant, so we can safely say that his study was large enough and conclusive enough to be reliable. Is the study designed well? Could unintentional bias have affected the results? Was there a systematic design to the study that remained the same throughout? What were the specific hypotheses of the study and how did the study test for them? If it was a clinical trial, who were the patients and how were they selected? Okay, so there are a few things to unpack here. The first question, was there a systematic design to the study that remained the same throughout, is most important for data collection. Was it collected in the same way across all populations? Are all methods and treatments for various groups the same? Because Putnam used census data, we can be fairly confident that he's passed this one as well. Regarding hypotheses, this is less important than you might think in terms of researching topics that are difficult to replicate due to scope or controversial nature or just general lack of public interest. Descriptive studies may lack a hypothesis entirely. More generally, was there a control group? Was the sample population that the study selected representative of the general population? Was the study as blinded as possible, meaning that no one involved with the study knew which condition was which and who was involved with it? These are all important questions. As far as control groups go, there is a serious problem in many widely circulated studies that fail to properly select or monitor a control group. A great example of this problem can be seen in some of the studies citing the health effects of marijuana that are often referenced by politicians. I dug into some of these studies and I can't tell you how many times I've uncovered that the control group was using alcohol or cigarettes or that the group of pot smokers studied was also using alcohol or cigarettes. They were controlling for marijuana use, but unless you have a group of over a thousand that are monitored and are exclusively pot smokers and a group of over a thousand that are also monitored for complete abstinence, the data is virtually worthless. In terms of selection bias, I often can tell that a study was bad or that conclusions cannot be reached because there was an issue with selection bias. Sometimes medical studies are a good example. There will be a clinical trial for something and the researchers will want to pull average people from the general population that represent what should be equally distributed health risks. But because medical trials often pay, poor people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds with bad diets or other health issues will be drawn to the trial. Researchers will try to control for these variables, which is almost impossible. Even if the subjects don't present any visible health problems, there is still selection bias going on because the selection isn't truly random. Most of the other questions in this article have been or will be answered to a varying degree within this video, so I want to spend the rest of the time talking about causation and drawing conclusions from data if there are any to be had. If I have to hear one more person say that correlation does not imply causation, yes, we all know that. So the real question here is how does one establish causation? I'm sure each and every one of you has had some experience with a leftist that tries to worm out of data relationships that are clearly causal just by repeating this trite phrase. Most scientists will tell you that a randomized controlled experiment is the best way to establish causation. While that is true, it's not really practical when discussing under-researched topics because the average individual does not have the resources or the know-how to do this. Firmly establishing causation is very, very difficult. There are complicated mathematical ways, but for debate or normal political discourse, this will not be an effective methodology. The ways to establish causation are still disputed, but I have found that there is something of a scientific consensus with regards to the methodology outlined by a scientist named Austin Bradford Hill. He laid out nine ways to establish causation, and although he applied this exclusively to epidemiology, it's a very helpful exercise in generally understanding what is required to state that causation exists between variables. And this paper that we're about to go through, applying the Bradford Hill criteria in the 21st century, is linked below. Criteria one, strength of association. 
Hill's first criterion for causation is strength of association. As he explained, the larger an association between exposure and disease, the more likely it is to be causal. To illustrate this point, Hill provided the classic example of Pott's examination of scrotal cancer incidents in chimney sweeps. The tremendous strength of association between that occupation and disease, nearly 200 times greater than seen in other occupations, led to a determination that the chimney soot was likely a causal factor. Contrarily, Hill suggested that small associations could more conceivably be attributed to other underlying contributors, i.e. bias or confounding, and therefore are less indicative of causation. Defining what constitutes a strong association is critical to the assessment of potentially causal relationships. Advances in statistical theory and the computational processing power have allowed scientists to delineate strong versus weak associations using more defensible mathematical criteria than Hill had in mind. Strength is no longer interpreted as simply the magnitude of an association. Furthermore, researchers have gained a greater appreciation for multifactorial diseases and the existence of determinate risk factors that are small in magnitude yet statistically strong. Today, statistical significance, not the magnitude of association, is the accepted benchmark for judging the strength of an observed association and thus its potential causality. Although he's talking about disease, a strong association is necessary to establish any causal relationship. If we refer back to Putnam's study, a strong association was established between trust of one's neighbor and the city or town in question's level of homogeneity. I know I showed this in Which Way Westerners, but let's take another gander at what a relatively solid association looks like on a graph. As you can see, the less diversity, the more trust one has in his or her neighbor. This is, of course, just one factor in establishing causation, but it is an important and a measurable one. Okay, criteria two, consistency. Traditionally, Hill's consistency criterion is upheld when multiple epidemiologic studies using a variety of locations, populations, and methods show a consistent association between two variables with respect to the null hypothesis. Hill stressed the importance of repetitive findings because a single study, no matter how statistically sound, cannot be relied upon to prove causation due to ever-present threats to internal validity. This criterion is still very appropriate for determining causal relationships. However, data integration practices have led to an evolution in thought on what constitutes consistency. The concept of data integration is inherently influential in the interpretation of the consistency criterion as it speaks to understanding a consistent story across multiple disciplines or practices. In the Putnam study, a total sample size of roughly 30,000 people was used. Embedded within the nationwide sample was a representative national sample of 3,000, as well as smaller samples representative of 41 very different communities across the United States, ranging from large metropolitan areas to small towns and rural areas. So in a non-epidemiological example, this still holds true. There is consistency in methodology and outcome across multiple data sets. Number three is specificity. This is one of the more difficult ones. Specificity. Hill suggested that associations are more likely to be causal when they are specific, meaning the exposure causes only one disease. While Hill understood that some diseases had multiple causes or risk factors, he suggested that if we knew all the answers, we might get back to a single factor responsible for the causation. This view is indicative of the fact that in Hill's era, exposure was often defined in terms of proxies for true exposures, such as an occupational setting or a residential location. Today, we attempt to specifically define exposures not in terms of a person's surroundings or conditions, but rather as an actual dose of a chemical, physical, or biological agent. Once again, we can apply this to Putnam's study. In terms of disease, what this means is that an exposure of sorts causes only one disease. Of course, you can't control that. And take smoking, for example, cumulative cigarette use causes a litany of diseases. But with regards to Putnam's study, there were specific questions asked about trust in neighbors, which we could liken to being a single disease. There was something that resembles a one-to-one -one outcome in terms of diversity and lack of trust. Criteria four is pretty easy, temporality. Temporality is perhaps the only criterion which epidemiologists universally agree is essential to causal inference. Consider that Rothman and Greenland, despite finding a lack of utility or practicality in any other criteria, referred to temporality as inarguable. Hill explained that for an exposure-disease relationship to be causal, exposure must precede the onset of the disease. In Putnam's study, he had studied data and published literature outlining how social cohesion and trust used to be much higher in times that predated multiculturalism. So temporality was already proven. The diversity came before the diminished levels of trust. Okay, criteria five, biological gradient. Hill wrote that if a dose response is seen, it is more likely that the association is causal. 
According to the traditional interpretation of biological gradient, the presence of a dose-response relationship supports the causal association between an exposure and an effect. Simply put, a little exposure should result in a little effect, and a large exposure should cause a large effect. And once again, we do see this upheld in the Putnam study. Let's look at this graph again. The grouping on this best fit line is pretty good, and you can see that if you add diversity to a town or a city, trust goes down. This is very similar to a dose response if you think about the addition of multiculturalism as the dose and the lack of trust as the response. A better reinforcer of the biological gradient theory would be to study areas that have experienced white flight since the census data used in Putnam's study was collected. Let's do number six and seven together, plausibility and coherence. The definition here in the study that we've been referencing is a bit wordy, so let's switch sources really quick just for the sake of simplicity. Biological plausibility, presence of a potential biological mechanism, and number seven, coherence, does the relationship agree with the current knowledge of the natural history and biology of the disease? So does the relationship follow the rules of biology and anatomy in terms of epidemiology, or in the case of the Putnam study, what we know about social interactions and human development society? I would say that Putnam's study is plausible by this definition, although this isn't a perfect comparison. And number seven, is the relationship coherent? Does it align with what we know about the natural world? I would also say yes to this. These two are much easier to apply to disease theory, but I still think they serve a function in evaluating all causal relationships. Number eight and number nine, again, are similar. Criteria eight, experiment. Hill explained that evidence drawn from experimental manipulation, particularly epidemiologic studies in disease risk declines following an intervention or cessation of exposure, may lead to the strongest support for causal inference. In Putnam's study, I would argue that the exposure factor is diversity and that the census data in itself shows that as societies become more homogenous, they become more trusting, which is akin to cessation in epidemiology. Similarly, there is criteria nine, analogy. Hill implied that when there is strong evidence of a causal relationship between a particular agent and a specific disease, researchers should be more accepting of weaker evidence that a similar agent may cause a similar disease. Analogy has been interpreted to mean that when one causal agent is known, the standards of evidence are lowered for a second causal agent that is similar in some way. So in the Putnam study, it should stand to reason that in towns and cities that were not used to compile the data, the same results can, to some degree, be inferred. I would also argue that replicability is related to this criteria. Since he used census data, could the study be replicated and proven again by someone else with later data? I think so, yes. I know this was a lot of information and that I'm not a scientist, but we get into debates and discussions with people all the time that use the correlation and causation argument to dismiss any number of legitimate sources and very convincing statistics. Also, without some serious mathematical muscle, you aren't going to be able to prove causation. So I hope that the comparison to epidemiological causation will prove helpful in some way. I know it's not a perfect method, but it's a good way to test for causation without getting very heavily into the math. I hope this gave you some tools to use in your everyday discourse because I did not learn any of this shit in school and it really would have helped me form better, more solid arguments rooted in provable truths. And that's how you change people's minds. Thanks guys, and I'll be back with one more video before the end of the month. Thanks again and I'll see you soon. Bye.